Thank you very much. I'm very pleased to be here to share in this very important occasion with you to meet President Lowry and also Dr. David Fleer, who invited me to come here. I will, I'm pleased to be here to see Christians and scholars struggling with issues that arise out of something that has kept me going for quite a while. I have a slight cough today, but I hope I can make it without it bothering us too much. The title of my presentation is Wrestling with the Cross and the Lynching Tree. People have often asked me which one of my books is my favorite. And I really couldn't say. It was like choosing one of my children. But with the cross and the lynching tree, I now have a favorite. <laughs> I have been asked also, <coughs> how long did it take you to write the cross and the lynching tree? The former time was about 10 years of research, thinking, and writing. I wrote many drafts before it was in published form. However, in a deepest sense, I've been writing this book all my life. I put my whole being into it and did not hold anything back. It was like I didn't choose to write it. The cross and the lynching tree chose me. I took my time and chose my words carefully as if the integrity of black faith and the freedom struggle that rose out of it were at stake. And I'm still writing it. And it will not be finished until I draw my last breath. I remember when I first sat down to write The Cross and the Lynching Tree. It was a transforming experience, empowering me to say things with clarity and power that even surprised me. Since that Kairos moment, I have been reading, thinking, and writing almost daily, trying to make sense out of how African Americans survived and resisted for centuries of the terror of white supremacy. The cross and the lynching tree focus on a special moment in my effort <clears throat> to make sense out of the lynching terror and black resistance to it. This book engaged my mind and heart and soul like no other subject. For years, I have been wrestling with the great paradox of Jesus' crucifixion and the lynching of African Americans. Reading, writing, and talking about it in my classes at Union, in lectures and sermons, at seminaries, colleges, universities, and churches, community groups, and even on TV and radio shows, and with anybody who would listen to me. The more I researched and wrote, the more I realized that this book had to be written with the most creative theological and literary imagination that I could muster, and with the best prose I could create. The subject was too important for a half-hearted, second-rate intellectual effort. I often wondered 
whether I had the literary talent to write the kind of book that this subject deserved. I'm not James Baldwin or Toni Morrison, and I only have so much writing talent. And as I was writing, I prayed over and over to God of the universe to give me the wisdom, insight, and especially <coughs> the courage to write the truth about the black religious experience in the United States. I hope that I have written a book that bears witness to black people's struggle for justice and to the faith that empowered and sustained them in their fight against great odds. Without qualification, I can honestly say I did my best. To do less would be a theological sin. The question I have been wrestling with is this. <coughs> How did African Americans survive and resist the lynching terror and keep their sanity, keep enough of it, to love and to marry each other, to raise their children, and to teach them to love and to respect each other? The answer is clear. For many blacks, it was their faith in God and in themselves that kept them emotionally and spiritually healthy enough to love not only themselves, but even the whites who lynched them. What an amazing ethical accomplishment. Whites used Christianity to lynch blacks and blacks used it to survive and to resist whites. The more I reflected on the cross and the lynching tree, the more I understood why black people, black Christians, could not turn away from the cross, even though it was used to enslave, segregate, and to lynch them. As James Baldwin said, Whites discovered the cross by way of the Bible. But black people discovered the Bible by way of the cross. This is the great paradox of black life. Now there are theologians who will have nothing to do with the cross as an explanation of what Jesus' work of salvation means. But I disagree. Christians cannot reject the cross because it makes some theologians uncomfortable or because some Christians misuse it. The cross sits at the center of the gospel of Jesus and at the center of black life in the United States, taking the form of the lynching tree. I have spent a lifetime I pointed out the hypocrisy and the mendacity of the white church in a white-dominated society while lifting up and exalting the voices and the experiences of the oppressed. I write out of my experience as an African-American growing up in segregated Arkansas and out of a deep theological conviction that the true power of the Christian gospel is an unambiguous call for liberation from forces of oppression and a fierce and uncompromising condemnation of all who oppress. I write on behalf of those who Latin American theologians call the crucified peoples of history. I write for the forgotten and the abused, the marginalized and the despised. I write for those who are penniless and jobless and landless and who have no social or political power. I write for immigrants, 
stranded on the U.S. border and for undocumented farm workers toiling in misery in our nation's agriculture fields. I write for Palestinians on the Gaza Strip, the West Bank, and in East Jerusalem. I write for Muslims, refugees, who live under the terror of war in Iraq, Pakistan, Afghanistan, and Syria. And I write for all people who care about humanity. I believe that until Americans especially theologians and Christians, until Americans can see the cross and the lynching tree together, until they can identify Christ with re-crucified black bodies hanging from a lynching tree, there can be no genuine understanding of Christian identity in America and no deliverance from the brutal legacy of slavery and white supremacy. As I started reading about lynching and about the historical situation of crosses in Rome during the time of Jesus, <clears throat> the analogy between them is striking. I kept asking myself, how did African Americans survive and resist the lynching terror? Terror. How did they do it? There were nearly 5,000 African American men, women, and children who were lynched in America following the Civil War, and their devastated families were left behind to cope with their great loss. Fathers and mothers, brothers and sisters, uncles and aunts, nephews and nieces, cousins and friends, and other loved ones strung up on lynching trees and burned beyond recognition. Often their body parts distributed as souvenirs. No blacks were exempted from the lynching terror the horror of the lynching tree. To live every day <coughs> under the terror of death is no easy matter. I grew up in Arkansas, a lynching state. I know from experience something about lynching. I watched my mother and father deal with the memory and the threats of lynching, which they talked to their three sons about. But the moment I read about it, examining lynching historically, listening daily to Billie Holiday sing Strange Fruit, I could not stop thinking that I might have been one of those black bodies swinging in the southern breeze. And my father and my brothers and even my mother could have been strange fruit hanging from the popular trees. It was a horrifying nightmare to think and to dream about that strange and bitter crop. It shook me at the core of my being, disrupting my theological identity making this book the most difficult and the most painful book I have written. The lynching horror is in my blood, flowing throughout my body. Lynching images appear in my dreams and force me to ask again and again how in the world did black people survive, not only physically, but most importantly, emotionally and spiritually, keeping their sanity in the midst of all that terror? I discovered, as strange and as paradoxically as it may appear, 
It was their identification with the cross <coughs> to which Jesus was brutally crucified that kept many blacks out of the madhouse. That was why they sang with passion, Jesus keep me near the cross. It was their faith in Jesus' cross, believing that if God is with Jesus, God must be with us because we are up on the cross too. My other question was, how could white Christians who say they believe Jesus died on the cross for them, how could they then turn around and put blocks on crosses and crucify them just like the Romans crucified Jesus? That was an amazing theological paradox for me. African Americans use faith to survive and resist while whites use faith in order to terrorize black people. Two communities, both Christians, embracing the same faith. Whites did lynchings on church grounds. How could they do it? That's where my passion came from as I wrote this text. That's where the paradox came from. That's where my theological wrestling came from. Many Christians embraced the conviction that Jesus died on the cross to redeem man, humankind from sin. Taking our place they say Jesus suffered on the cross and gave his life as a ransom for many. The cross is the great symbol of the Christian narrative of salvation. Unfortunately, <coughs> during the course of 2,000 years of Christian history, the cross as a symbol of salvation has been detached from the ongoing suffering and oppression of human beings, the crucified people of history. The cross has been transformed into a harmless, non-offensive ornament that Christians wear around their necks rather than reminding us of the cost of discipleship, it has become a form of cheap grace, as Bonhoeffer put it, an easy way to salvation that doesn't force us to confront the power of Christ's message and mission. Now, in my chapter on Reinhold Niebuhr, America's most important Christian social ethicist in the 20th century and a theologian I teach at Union, I expose Niebuhr's blindness to and tacit complicity in white oppression, slavery, segregation, and the terror of lynching have little or no place in the theological reflections of Niebuhr or any other white theologian. Niebuhr had little empathy for what he called the lesser races, subjugated by white colonialists. He claimed that North America, United States, was a virgin continent when Anglo-Saxon came, with only a few Indians in the primitive state of culture, he said. Niebuhr saw America as being elected by God to expand empire. And he wrote about Arabs of Palestine and of people of color in the third world in a similar manner 
offering a moral justification for colonialism. I write about a dialogue, radio dialogue, between Niebuhr and James Baldwin following the September 1963 bombing of the 16th Street Baptist Church in Birmingham that killed four little black girls. Niebuhr spoke in a language of moderation about that event that infuriated James Baldwin and was disarmed by Baldwin's eloquence and fire. Baldwin said this to him, the only people in this country at this moment who believe either in Christianity or in the country are the most despised minority in it. It is ironical that people who were slaves here, the most beaten and dis despised people here, should be at this moment the only hope the country has. It doesn't have any other, Baldwin said. None of the descendants of Europe seem to be able to do or have taken upon themselves to do what Negroes are trying to do. And this is not a chauvinistic or racial outlook, he says. It probably has something to do with nature of life itself. It forces you in any extremity, any extreme, to discover what you really live by. Whereas most Americans, Baldwin said, have been for so long so safe and so sleepy that they don't any longer have any real sense of what they live by. I think they really think it may be Coca-Cola, unquote. <laughs> now, if theologians <coughs> like Niebuhr could ignore lynching and white supremacy, there must be something defective in their understanding of the faith itself. If it weren't defective, then white Christians wouldn't put black people on crosses. Niebuhr and other white theologians wouldn't have been silent about it. I look around and I see the same thing happening today regarding the prison industrial complex, which Michelle Alexander calls the new Jim Crow. You can lynch people by more than just hanging them on a tree. You can incarcerate them and shoot them down like dogs in the streets of our cities. How long will African Americans have to live with the terror of white supremacy. I'm a Christian. Suffering gives rise to faith. Faith helps you to deal with suffering in your life that you cannot <coughs> rationally understand. And at the same time, suffering contradicts the faith that it gives rise to. It's like the biblical Job wrestling with the angel, bi biblical J Jacob wrestling with the angel in Genesis 32. I can't give up with the wrestling, with the great contradictions in black life. In writing this book, I found my inspiration in the faith of black people <clears throat> and in militant black ministers like Martin Luther King Jr. and Malcolm X, along with writers like James Baldwin, Tony Morris, Ida B. Wells, and Richard Wright, Frederick Douglass, as well as the great blues artists of my youth. These ministers and artists and writers gave me a sense of awe 
in the presence of humanity, fighting for justice against great odds. I saw that for most ordinary blacks, it was the blues and religion that offered them the chief weapons of resistance. It was religion and the blues that offered sources of hope that there was more to life than just what one encountered daily in a white man's world. In the words of the great poets and writers, in great blues singers and in the thunderous services of the black church, I discovered those who were able to confront the bleak circumstances of their lives and yet defy fate and suffering and make the most of what little life had to offer them. Through these connections, I found a way to respond to black suffering in all of it, in many of its forms. Although I wrote <coughs> a doctoral dissertation on the great Swiss theologian, Karl Barth, I never taught a course on Barth because like peop I like people who talk and write about real concrete world where people are suffering. And unless I can feel it in my gut, I can't say it. The poor who are suffering help me to say it because I feel their pain. The literary and activist people marching in the streets <coughs> help me to say it because they talk and write about suffering with imagination and power. The poets and orators give me energy. Academic theologians talk about things far removed, way out there in some intellectual stratosphere where only they inhabit they talk to each other. They give each other degrees and recommend each other for teaching positions in colleges and universities and seminaries. And they write essays and books about each other, emphasizing their importance in the theological tradition. Since they control the theological journals and professional societies where theology is discussed, they can exclude and isolate anybody who does not view theology the way they do. But the real world is not out there where they live and think. So that's why I turn to the poets and the activists. They talk to people, they talk about people I know and love, the marginalized of the world. Being Christian <coughs> is somewhat like being black. It's a paradox, a profound contradiction with many incongruities. You grow up black, and you can't help but wonder why whites treat you like they do, and like you're not a human being. It is hard to figure that out, especially as an innocent child. And yet, <coughs> at the same time, my mother and father told me, don't you hate like they hate. Hatred is too heavy a sight to carry, wrote James Baldwin. It was my parents' faith that gave them the inner resources to transcend the brutality 
and to see the beauty in the tragedy of their lives. It's a mystery, a profound mystery, a deep mystery how <coughs> African Americans, <coughs> after two centuries of slavery, another century of lynching and Jim Crow segregation, and yet many of us still come out loving white people. Now, many white people who hear me talk and read my books don't think I really love them. <laughs> but I do. They always have a strange expression on their faces when I say that, and I look, they look at me like I couldn't, I must be kidding. No, it's no joke. For the deeper the love, the more the passion, the more the hurt. Especially when people you love hurt you. We blacks are their brothers and sisters, white people's brothers and sisters. And yet they treat us like we are not even human beings. See, the cross is a paradoxical religious symbol because it inverts the world's value system with the good news that hope comes by way of the cross. Now, unlike many blacks, I don't ever remember wishing <coughs> that I was white because being black and beard in Arkansas and Macedonia AME Church was so wonderful and beautiful, especially as I saw blackness embodied in the lives of my mother and father and a host of other proud men and women in Arkansas. The reality of love in my community was so strong, so real, that I didn't have time to think about being white. I truly love being black. The spiritual values of my parents and other blacks were more important than the material things I saw in the white world that hated me. Black music and dance, black loving, hugging and kissing, black preaching and singing. Everything black was so much more interesting <laughs> and inspiring. The beauty of black, black, the beauty of blackness was everywhere. Joe Lewis knocking out Max Miller with power and grace. Jesse Owens running with pride for his people in the face of a German white supremacy and Hitler's hate. Jackie Robertson and Willie Mays hitting, running, catching, and sliding, making art on a baseball diamond. Black people can make art out of anything. <laughs> they could just put a black stamp on it on whatever they did, like Goose Tabler and Marcus Haynes of the Harlem Globetrotter shooting and dribbling, entertaining people with a basketball all over the world. So beautiful and so black. There was so much to love about blackness. Whether in a juke joint or at a dance hall, Black bodies were swinging and moving with, to the blues and to B.B. King and Muddy Waters and in church, listening to the sound of Sister Ora Wallace singing, I'm working on the building, or my mother, Lucy Cone, raising her voice, proclaiming this little light of mine. Black beauty was all over beard in the laughter and the play of black. 
in the style of black talk and walk. And as a child, I was in my element, for blackness saved me from whiteness and kept me sane, believing that I was somebody. See, the question is, how do people know? How do they know that they are not what the world says they are when they have so few political and social resources to defend their humanity? So few economic resources to even physically survive. And so few educational resources to express their somebodyness. For many blacks in the U.S., it was their faith, which is inseparable from their culture. That's why I call the blues secular spirituals. The blues are spiritual resources that enable black people to express their humanity. James Baldwin only finished high school. Richard Wright only the eighth grade. But they had their say. And thereby bore witness to a transcendence in blackness that no one could destroy. Blackness is the image of God in black people. A tremendous spiritual condition. Blackness is the light in the white darkness. B.B. King never got out of grade school. And Louis Armstrong hardly went to any school at all. And I said to myself, if Louis Armstrong could blow a trumpet like that, forget it. I'm going to write theology the way Louis Armstrong blows that trumpet. <laughs> and the way Billie Holiday sings Strange Fruit, improvising as I write, and letting it all hang out, expressing the souls of black folk. Our spiritual strivings, as W.E.B. Du Bois put it, refusing to follow a theological methodology defined by white theologians. Negro blood, Du Bois said, has a message for the world. He was right. I want to speak the message of liberation to reach deep down in black existence for those cultural and spiritual resources that enable African Americans to express themselves when the world said they had nothing to say. I remember growing up in Arkansas where blacks roll a lot of masks. As the great Paul Lawrence Dunbar put it, we wore the mask that grins and lies. I wore a mask in Arkansas as a child when I went down to white people's town in Bearden and other places, but I didn't wear it in my own community. I wore a mask in the white community because I knew what they could do to my family and to me. I wore a mask even in graduate school because I had to find a way to graduate <laughs> in an academic environment that refused to acknowledge my black existence. But I kept saying to myself, one of these days I'm going to take that mask off and say what I think to white people and make up for lost time. <laughs> and that's what I've been doing for the last 40 something years. <laughs> I 
right to encourage African Americans whenever they can to take off their masks to get in touch with their inner resources in order that they may say, have their say and say it forcefully and truthfully as you can, but be careful when you take that mask off. Don't be foolish. Not all blacks could reveal their true self because white people have a lot of power, still do, controlling your employment, often <coughs> your physical and social well-being. I took my math off when I wrote my first book, three years after I had my PhD. You must be ready for white reactionary response when black people speak the truth about white supremacy in America, about the small racist mind like Donald Trump. Well, I guess we got a lot of Trump people here. That's all right. <laughs> Whites do not like straight talking, independent thinking, uppity Negroes. They try to punish them any way they can to make an example of them so other blacks will stay in their place. Now let me close with a statement about my mother and father. My mother and father didn't have my opportunity. So when I write and speak, I try to write and speak for them. This is Lucy and Charlie Cohn's book. And all the blacks who struggle against the terror of the lynching tree. They never had a chance to stand before white people as I do and tell them what they think. So I have to do it for them. I try to do this all over the world. So when I sit down to write or stand up to talk, I think of Lucy and Charlie Cohn and all the other Lucys and Charlie Cohns, Mays and Janitors, who are out there who cannot speak. I feel their spirit flowing through my body, encouraging me to speak the truth. They deepen my spirituality and give me something to hold on to, something I can feel in the depth of my being, giving me strength and courage to say it like it is. It was a profound, very profound spiritual experience writing and talking about this book because I was doing something for people I love who could not and would never have a chance to speak in context I do. I feel deeply the need to speak for people who cannot speak. For those, as Martin Luther King Jr. said, who have been left out on the sunlight of opportunity. If there is passion when I write, that's because I'm thinking about Lucy and Charlie, my daddy and my mama trying to do justice to their courage and their faith. And I think if I can do that, do what they taught me, I will stay on the right track, bearing witness as best I can to the black blood 
that's flowing in the streets, the jails, and even in our churches throughout America. Thank you.